Good afternoon, everyone. What I'd like to do is take you all on what I call a tour of the Blevy. We live in a world now where almost all of our interactions are driven by search. If I pull out my phone right now and search for, OK, Google, full text search Golang, we're going to get results just like this. <laughs> Blevy search, the number one search result. And that's a project we started to bring full text search into the Golang community. So what is full text search? The, one of the first things people think of is the ability to have inexact matching of the results. So if someone had typed full dash text, or if they typed searching instead of search, maybe they even misspelled Golang and wrote Glowang, we're still going to expect Blevy to be near the top of the results. So let's take a look at an example, because one of the techniques we use is uh, text analysis that's specific to the language. So let's look at an example in French. I have a sentence fragment here, un article de Wikipedia, l'encyclopédie libre. The first step we're going to do is called tokenization. Here we take the sentence and we decompose it into individual words. Next, we're going to put everything in lowercase, because when we're searching, we don't care about any differences in case. Then we're going to perform a step called article elision. This is not unique to French, but it's one of a handful of languages that does require this step. So here we're going to take the article le, which has been prepended with the apostrophe, and we're going to strip that off. Then we do stop word removal. Stop words are words that occur so frequently in language that they're not helpful in terms of finding relevant results. So the words un and de are going to be removed from this sentence. And then finally, we're going to form a step called stemming. This is where we're going to take generally prefixes and suffixes and trim them off to leave us, leave us with some root words. In the case of French, we're also going to remove accent marks over characters as well. But what does all this get us? Well, the real benefit is that if we had a document that had that sentence in it and we indexed it, the term encyclopede is going to be in the index. That may not even be a word, right? But all that matters is that when someone comes along and searches for encyclopedies, maybe they, they left off the article and they didn't put an accent mark over the E and they've used the plural form, it's still going to analyze to that same term, encyclopede. So at the index level, we're still getting an exact match. And what we've done is we've built a project that lets you do exactly that using Go. To install the project, you're going to use the standard GoGet tooling. That's a really important feature for getting, making sure your project is usable by the Go community. So let's go ahead and write some code that actually does the example we just saw. The first thing we're going to do is import the package. The first package you see there is the standard Blevy package, and all Blevy programs are going to use that. The second one is because we know we're going to be indexing uh, text that's in French. So now the next step is we're going to create what we call an index mapping. The index mapping describes how we take your documents and put them into the index. Most of the time, or I'd say many times, you can use the default mapping, which is what we create on the first line. But we're going to do one other thing. We're going to, tell it, we're going to set that default analyzer. And this is basically saying, unless I tell you anything else, assume the text is in French. Now that we've done that, we can go ahead and create the index. So this takes two arguments. Uh, the first is here is the path, which we're just going to call wiki.blevy and then the mapping that we created on the previous slide. Now we're ready to index some data. So I've got a, a Go structure here called article with two fields, ID and body. They're both strings. I'm going to set the first one to the Wikipedia and the second one to the sentence that we looked at earlier. And then we index, use the index method to put that into the index. The first argument is the ID, and the second argument is the whole structure that we want to put into the index. And so at the end of the slide, we've actually got data on disk corresponding to the data we indexed. So now we're ready to go ahead and search. Now, Blevy supports many kind of queries. We're only going to look at one here, which is a match query. And we're going to look for that encyclopedies term that we talked about earlier. The query is describing what we're looking for. But we're going to create another object called the request. And the way I think of it is this is telling Blevy how we want the results returned to us. So things like how many results per page. Again, we're just going to use the default request here. And now that we have the request, we can actually execute the search using the search method. And that's going to return us the results. And then finally, we print it out. So we've looked at six slides of code. If we put it all together, this is what we're going to end up with. You can see it's only about 35 lines of code or so. And when we run that, that's going to do exactly what we talked about. You notice we searched for encyclopedies, but we matched a document that had one encyclopedia. So it's pretty powerful in just a few lines of code. Now I could go through feature by feature. It gets a little dry. What I think is a little more interesting is recognizing the fact that we've gotten contributions from all across the world. And each one of those highlights 
an interesting part of the library. And that's where we're going to start our tour. So the first stop is in Melbourne, Australia. We got a contribution from someone named Conrad Pankoff. And this contribution is what we call the BoltDB storage adapter. That may not make any sense, so let's, let's take a step back. Blovy has the ability to be extended, and we use Go interfaces to make that possible. So we have one really important interface called the KV store. The basic idea is Blovy doesn't care how we read and write data as long as it conforms at the lowest level to this KV store interface. And that allows us to plug in a whole bunch of alternative implementations. So let's look at what that interface actually is. KV store can be divided up into two pieces, a reader and a writer, and those are also interfaces. So we'll look at each in turn. The first is the reader, and this has three methods that are really important. We have a get, which is your standard key value lookup. You can get a key, return the value. We then have two iterators. The first is a prefix iterator. This has to be able to iterate all the keys that start with a given prefix. And the second method is the range iterator, which has to iterate all the keys between the start key and end key. Now, there's one other important rule that's not a part of the method signatures, but it is a part of the contract of being a reader. And that's that readers must provide this consistent snapshot view of the data that's separate from any concurrent writes that may be happening at the same time. And that's an important property that we build on at, at higher levels of levy. So how do writes take place? Well, writes are all done through a batch. So there's two methods here, one to create a new batch and another to execute it. So you want to know what's a batch. Well, these are the methods you're probably expecting to see in the writer. We have a set method. This is going to update a single key with a value. Delete will delete that key. And one you may not be familiar with is merge. The idea of a merge is we're going to read a key, perform some logic, and then write that value back out. That's an optimization that some key value stores are going to let us take advantage of for higher performance. And again, there's another rule that's not a part of the method signatures, but another important property of a batch, and that's that batches have to be atomic. So readers are either going to see all these changes or none of them. That's, again, something Blevy builds on at a higher level to deliver the right functionality. So again, what is the significance of this BoltDB storage adapter? Well, it helps to look at the KV landscape before this contribution. We had two implementations. One was LevelDB, and the other was InMem. Now, the LevelDB one was great, but it uses Seago, and it requires users to already have LevelDB installed on their system. The other was InMem, which was pure Go, but it doesn't actually write bits to disk. It's in memory, so it doesn't meet what you sort of expect. So the big gaping hole here is we had no pure Go storage format. That has side effects, like you could not go get Blevy back in the day, because you'd have to have all these dependencies satisfied before it would work. So now that we added the BoltDB storage adapter, that's, that solves that problem, because BoltDB is a pure Go KV storage. So not only did it sort of make us sort of greatly step up the capabilities of the library, it also really changed the landscape. I have a list here of the KV stores that we support today, and you can see we support seven. So we have a variety that are Seago, a variety of them that are pure Go, and a variety of them that are in memory only. Uh, so it really sort of was a, sort of a key change for the project to get us to that next level. After that, we sort of realized, well, we've got this awesome contribution, and we haven't even started telling anyone about the library. So we decided, let's take the show on the road. So I went to FOSDEM and gave a talk in the Go developer room. And this was awesome. It was the first time I was really able to talk face to face with other developers about our project. But something even more amazing happening. A hand went up in the back of the room, and they asked, do you support indexing Arabic text? I hadn't given it much thought. We had some of the components, because some of the components for this are shared, uh, but we didn't have a working solution. And that leads us to our next stop on the tour. We got a contribution from Salman Aljamez. He's currently located in Riyadh. And he actually stepped up and helped us fill out the missing pieces so we could support Arabic text. Well, how do you go about adding support for a language to Blevy? Just like with the KV store, we use Go interfaces to make the project extendable. So there's two key interfaces we're going to look at. The first is tokenizers, and the second is token filters. Tokenizer has a very straightforward API. It takes a, a slice of bytes coming in, and it returns a token stream back. A token stream is just a slice of tokens, and these basically represent the words that you're looking at. Then we have the token filter, which is responsible for taking a token stream in and returning a token stream back out. It could be the original unmodified. It could be have tokens added, removed, or modified. And the final important piece is what we call the analyzer. And this is not an interface. This is a structure. And this is because it composes 
a tokenizer, a single tokenizer, and then zero or more token filters in a way that we provide the functionality that you think of of taking a starting point, a slice of bytes, and having a token stream at the end as your final result. So let's look at what that actual Arabic analyzer looks like. You see here we have tokenizer, Unicode tokenizer. That's a standard one, right? So this is not something new. This is something shared that we're reusing. Then we have five token filters. The first two uh, are actually, again, shared ones. They're putting things in lowercase and normalizing Unicode characters. But the last three are specific to Arabic. This is where we do the Arabic stop word removal, normalize Arabic characters, and finally uh, perform stemming uh, on the Arabic words themselves. So let's go one level deeper again and look inside the stemmer. Now, I don't have the full, full source for the stemmer here, but I have the one method stem, which is really where most of the work is done. This is, so this is responsible for stemming the bytes within a single token. You notice the first step we do is we take the bytes and turn them into runes. And that's because the transformations we're making, with the, which are the prefixes and suffixes you see on the side, these are defined in terms of Unicode runes and not in terms of the, the actual UTF byte sequence. So we do that conversion, and then we're ranging through the characters, make the transformation, and ultimately turn them back into bytes for the next step in the pipeline. Now this is what I would say is a pretty simple stemmer. Generally, you refer to these as light stemmers, where you're just doing exact matches on prefixes and suffixes. There are more complex stemmers out there, but this is, again, a very simple one. And the addition of Arabic added a lot to the suite of, of languages we support. As you can see, we have support for about 22 languages right now. And we have probably five or six that are nearly done that are kind of in that same state Arabic was in before, where the, some of the pieces are there and just a few of them need to be done. Now, one other really interesting thing happened when we started working on Arabic. Salman pushed some code, I ran the test, and I noticed there was a test case that was failing. I was curious, so I took a look at the test case. So I've zoomed in on that piece now. And it's just sort of your standard test case, right? You've got an expected sequence, and you've got something that's what, actually what you got back that didn't match. Now, I don't speak Arabic, but I can at least visually tell these two things are different, and that's why the test case is failing. So I dug a little deeper, and I looked in the test case. Now, the important thing here is that uh, fourth line that says term, slice of bytes, and has some characters. That's the expected token. But you notice that doesn't even match what I saw on the console as the expected token. So at this point, it's helpful to remember Arabic's a right-to-left language. Something here is reversing the characters. But I don't know which one it is. And this, as a developer, this is kind of unsettling. Where is this happening? Is it my editor that's reversing the characters? Is it the go print statement reversing the errors? Or maybe is it my terminal application reversing the errors? I need to know. So I need to sort of sanity check everything. So I dropped down a level. I ran hex dump on the go source file so I could see the raw bytes. And I found the one highlighted in red there, which is D8A7. That's the UTF-8 sequence uh, for the Arabic Alef character. And that occurred first in the, in the raw bytes on the file. And I see in my editor, that's also the character that's displayed first. So I sort of restored sanity. My editor is not tricking me or confusing me. It's showing the byte sequence inside the string in the same sequence as they are on disk. Then I ran the Go test program and piped that output through hex dump. And I found that same D8A7 character. But now, it's still the first sequence of bytes in the output, but it's the last character displayed visually. So now I know even the Go program is outputting the bytes in the order I expect. It's something after that. Now I dug a little deeper later. It's the macOS terminal app that's actually doing the reversing. And again, I want to highlight this isn't right or wrong behavior necessarily. Uh, it's just different behavior. And you have to understand this uh, in terms of all the tools in your tool chain and how things are operating. So really the takeaway here is if you're going to be mixing left to right and right to left text, you need to urge caution because there's just a lot of places things can go wrong. And more importantly, this is something I hadn't given any thought to until someone came to our project and contributed support for Arabic. Now, next on our tour, we went to GopherCon Denver, and we gave a lightning talk. At first, we were sort of not too excited. I mean, it's just a lightning talk. What's the real value there? But we thought, what could we do that would excite people? So we built something we call Hugo Site Integration. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Hugo. It's a static website generator built in Go. A lot of people build their sites and host them using this. And so we thought, what if we added a way, an easy way that you could use Go to search your Hugo site? So we built some integration, and we sort of unveiled this at GopherCon. And the reason it was cool was because the GopherCon site itself was built using Hugo. So we were able to demo the GopherCon site itself searchable with Blevy. 
This had an awesome effect. There were some emails that were got traded around later on. There was a lot of interest in adding Blobby support to other programs. And just a few weeks ago, I got a notification that Pedro Nasser in Brazil has added support for uh, searching Caddy using Blobby. So again, this is really awesome to us because this really symbolizes that people are taking Blobby and not just contributing back to Blobby itself, but enhancing their own applications with Blobby. This is really exciting. Now, I don't have time to go through all of the different contributions, but I went ahead and put together a map of some of the places I've gone to talk about Blevy and all the places we've got con contributions from. And I'm really proud when I look at this map because we really have started to build a global community working on this project. So I'd like to thank all the contributors right now. But here we are today. We're all at .go. And the thing I'm really excited about is just waiting to find out what awesome contribution is going to come out of me being here. I look forward to meeting as many of you as I can today. And thank you for your time.